folks, welcome back. Thank you for watching. Please do hit subscribe if you haven't done so yet. It really does help when you do that. So welcome to the end of December 2020 Q&A video. You guys have been so busy in the comments section this last month that uh, I've got lots to get through today. So I'm gonna rattle through these as quickly as I can. But yeah, I've done these end of month Q&A videos for a couple of months now and you guys seem pretty into them. So I'm gonna carry on with them into 2021 and see how we go. So the first question today is Jay Curtin. Be nice getting you out to the Gordon Smith factory. Can't believe how good these guitars are for the price, especially being hand built. Yeah, I've never played a Gordon Smith guitar and I don't know too much about them. Um, they come up for sale pretty often on eBay and Reverb when I'm searching for used left-handed guitars, as I do way too often. Um, you can almost guarantee there's gonna be a Gordon Smith in there somewhere. So yeah, I don't know much about them aside from being made in the UK and they always seem to be pretty good prices for what seem to be semi-custom instruments. So yeah, as I've said in a Q&A video before, in 2021, I'd love to go out and start meeting some manufacturers and look around people's factories and things like that, do some more out in the field type videos. So once the whole you know coronavirus thing settles down a wee bit. So yeah, add Gordon Smith to that list. I'd love to go and find out more about them. Matthew Bartles, would this be a good pedal for bass guitar too? And this was the Electro Harmonics Black Finger Tube Compressor. Yes, absolutely. I've sold that pedal now, but I used to use it on bass all the time. And I now use the Effectrode PC2A Tube Compressor, and that works outstandingly on bass too. There's something about tube pedals, you know, the warmth and the harmonic richness, insert adjective here, that just works really nicely with the sort of the fatness of a bass guitar. So yeah, really recommend that pedal, especially the, I think they call it the squash mode, which is a more extreme compression. When you're recording bass guitar, not so much gigging live, but recording it in the studio, you generally want to compress a bass pretty heavily to make it sit in the track. And that pedal worked really nicely for that. So yeah, absolutely check one out. The uh, Black is a great compressor. Paul Stafford Cook. Hi Joe, I enjoy your videos. Thank you. Being a Gibson guy, I've never really bonded with Stratocasters. They are just too thin sounding. Any tips on how to make a Strat sound beefy whilst keeping single coils? Yeah, I had exactly the same problem when I first started playing a Strat because I came from a kind of Les Paul into a Marshall classic rock world. So as soon as I picked up a Strat and put it into the same rig, it did sound a bit thin and weedy. So a few tips I would have is firstly, uh, look into the uh, pickup base plates that you can buy. I made a video about this a couple of years ago. Hopefully the link should be up there now. But essentially they are little metal plates that you don't even have to install. The magnetic pull of the pickups holds them in place, but you put them underneath the pickup and it essentially turns a strap pickup into a sort of tele bridge pickup. It reflects the magnetic field up, beef to pick up up and makes it a bit more rocking. So you can buy very expensive posh versions. I just went for the cheap ones just to see if I liked them. As it turned out, I didn't. I took them off these pickups as soon as I shot that video because it did kind of darken the clean sound a little bit, which I didn't like. Um, but yes, if you're looking to beef up the sound of your guitar, they're a great starting point. A lot of people like them on just the bridge pickup so they can really rock out on the bridge and then kind of use these two unaffected by the base plates for cleaner stuff. But yeah, that's a very good and fairly cheap starting point. The other thing I would suggest is to wire the bottom tone knob to the bridge pickup, not the middle. And I think a lot of strats nowadays come wired like that as standard, but back in the day, vintage spec strats always had the bottom tone wired to the middle pickup. So by swapping it around, you can then go to your back pickup for heavier gain sounds and use that bottom tone knob just to shelve off a few of those really brittle, aggressive high frequencies and move it like one step closer to a humbucker in the terms of high end roll off and then obviously open it up for cleaner sounds as well. So that's a really nice tip. A lot of people do that. The other thing I would say is learn to love a tube screamer. I never really got gain sounds with a Strat until I plugged this into a tube screamer. There is something about that circuit, like the mid push and the high end roll off, that just everything about a Strat that isn't kind of rocking like a Les Paul, it just reverses that. And especially if you're then stacking the tube screamer either into an amp that's belting or another overdrive pedal, it works great as a kind of like preamp EQ type thing for a Strat. That sort of mid push especially really makes a Strat come alive with gain. So learn to love a tube screamer, bottom tone knob to the bridge pickup, 
and experiment with some base plates. Those are my three biggest tips. You can buy like hot rails pickups and strat sized humbucker pickups that you could maybe use on like a coil split so you still have that single coil sound there if you want it. That's a bit more invasive so I'd start with the sort of the simple things and then if you need to go further play around with pickups and electronics or just use a different guitar. You know strats are amazing for clean sounds especially that sort of glassy quacky thing. If you don't like the gain sounds with the strat play a different guitar for gamey sounds you know you you can always experiment and you know get some really cool sounds out of it but that's where I would start with a strat for sure. Silvio Stefan sorry I think I've just killed your name there great demo does it do anything else than a normal great overdrive or is it just a marketing tool calling it a preamp and this is about the Hudson broadcast pedal now, I think when it comes to the word preamp in the land of guitar effects, it can mean a lot of different things. So I have the Terry Audio White Rabbit at the start of my pedal board, always on as a kind of clean buffer, essentially. So that is a preamplifier for my guitar signal. It drops the impedance down. I do actually use it for a slight level boost as well. So it's a clean preamp for my entire rig. The Hudson Broadcast is an overdrive pedal, but it's based around the circuitry of an old recording mixing desk preamp. So it's not wrong to call it a preamp because it is a mixing desk preamp in a box for that kind of direct to console, Beatles revolution, gritty, direct, sort of really gnarly overdrive sound. But I think what you're probably referring to is the sort of the new breed of pedals that are dedicated preamps that are designed to replace the front end of your guitar amp. So you plug them directly into your effects loop return. It bypasses the front end of your amp and feeds your power amp directly. So I think that's probably what you're referring to here. Um, yeah, so it's not wrong to call the Hudson Broadcast a preamp pedal because it is a preamp in a box. And you could use it to feed the power amp directly. It has a lot of headroom, especially running at 24 volts like I run it. it, has a lot of output, so you could use it for that. Personally, I wouldn't know, because in terms of EQ, it only has a high pass filter. And for a preamp, you're generally gonna want at least a three band EQ. So to do that kind of, you know, bypass the front end of your amp thing, I would always use a pedal designed for that specific purpose. Kingsley makes some really nice ones. Victory make them nowadays. There's a few other companies that do it. Um, and they're generally tube based as well, to, so you don't have a sort of solid state front end going into a tube power amp. Um, so I would use a dedicated preamp for that specific purpose to feed your power amp, but it's not wrong or marketing hype to call the Hudson Broadcaster preamp pedal. It just depends on how, how you're defining preamp in that particular circumstance. So it preamp can mean a lot of different things, of which the Hudson Broadcast is one, just maybe not for every single preamp purpose. Dude, seriously. Okay. Cool. Maybe you'll like the new Boss Tone Bender. That looks really cool, doesn't it? I saw the video Boss put out the other day of Barry Cadogan playing, I don't know if it was the Boss uh, Tone Bender he was playing or an older one just to show you what a Tone Bender sounds like, but the tones in that video, I mean, I love Barry Cadogan's playing anyway, but uh, the tones are outstanding. Um, there's t I, it looks really cool, that pedal. There's two things that do worry me a little bit. Firstly, but they say they've secured a very limited batch of new old stock transistors to make that pedal. The chances of it selling out within two minutes and then ending, they all end up on reverb for massively inflated prices, I think it's pretty high. I don't know quite what the production run's going to be, but whenever anything's super limited, that tends to mean it's going to explode on the second hand market and you'll never see one in the real world. Um, but also, it's a collaboration with Solar Sound. And in, in my experience, whenever I see Solar Sound on a pedal, that generally quadruples the price point. So, yes, it's a, Bo a Boss Wasacraft pedal, so you'd expect it to be. £200 or less. Having Solar Sound on there, I anticipate it being a fair bit more. I don't know what the price point is yet. But yeah, I mean, it sounds really cool. It's a very interesting concept. Uh, Boss seems to be doing a lot more of the sort of collaborations nowadays, like the um, Angry Driver with JHS and things like that. So yeah, I'd, I'd love to check one out if um, one ever materialises. I don't think they're actually released yet. Jacob Willett. The Fane F70 really does have surprising chime and pedal slash amp friendly frequencies. That's a tongue twister. I would definitely get this if Celestian Alnico creams didn't exist. Yeah, you know, Fane speakers in general seem to be really nicely balanced. They don't have that kind of 
upper mid-range hump that Celestians tend to. So they won't be for everybody or every amp or your personal preferences or whatever, but they're a really, really good alternative to Celestian if you're looking to experiment and try different speakers out. If the Celestian Alnico creams didn't exist, don't forget that the F70 is literally half the price of a Celestian Alnico cream. So if you're buying new, definitely check out um, all the famous speakers, but the F70 especially. It's the only ceramic speaker I've ever plugged in and played and instantly bonded with. I'm usually much more of an Alnico guy, but that particular speaker is really, really nice. And this is another question about um, the Fane F70. That blew me away. As soon as I heard that 330, I was hooked. You started on the neck pickup and it was glorious, but I thought as soon as Joe hits the bridge pickup, it will cut my head off. No, it was nice. A very clear, balanced and dynamic speaker. Maybe my creams need a partner. Yeah, sort of clear and balanced is the perfect description for that F70. It's really, really lovely. Maybe my creams need a partner. This is something I'm gonna do next year, which is only 12 hours away now, um, I'm gonna try and get a two by 12 cabinet because I've never looked into speaker pairings. I've had different speakers in different amps running together, but never in the same cabinet being fed by the same amplifier. So in 2021, I'm gonna get a two by 12 and look much deeper into pairing different speakers together. Speaking to the guys at Fane, the A60 and the F70 were designed to be run together. They really complement each other in terms of frequencies. And I am currently running the two together, one in the Hughes and Kettner, the other in my Dr. Z DB4, and they do sound amazing together, albeit in different amplifiers. So having the two together in a cabinet, I'm really looking forward to trying. So that's coming in 2021, is some uh, a closer look at speaker pairings in a two by 12. Jonathan Kidd, I have these in my R8, and this is the OX4 Hot Dwayne Path Humbuckers. Fantastic rock pickups while still retaining warmth and clarity. I love them, they sound great in your guitar as well. Yep, these pickups have finally made me want to play this guitar. There's another question about this coming up, but I've had this guitar for about 17 years and just never bonded with it. There's a few things about it I've never really kind of liked. It's got a really sharp edge on it, so it just shreds your arm. Uh, sonically, there was always guitars I wanted to play before this one. It's got a very chunky neck on it, which even for my massive hands is a bit cumbersome. I think the binding up the side of the frets, if you try and do any sort of pull off on the high E string, it just gets stuck down the gap between the fret and the binding, really irritating. So I've never really bonded with this guitar, but the OX4 Hot Dwayne's, I have, I've played this guitar so much in the last month since putting these pickups in. They just work, like low wind sort of vintage spec paths, just sounded a bit anemic in this guitar. I don't know what it was. It's really heavy. It's like 10 pounds, nine ounces or something. It's a real hulking chunk of wood. And for whatever reason, sort of classic path just didn't really suit it. So these ones with Alnico 5 magnets all round, about 10% overwound over a sort of standard path, uncovered to the glassy high ends there still. It's, they're just amazing. They just really suit this guitar. So yeah, they, they have like a slight bit more compression to them, a lovely sort of glassy clarity up top without the covers. They're just absolutely magic pickups. This guitar is such a rocker now, but it does clean sounds incredible too. So yeah, really, really recommend OX4 pickups. Like I've, I've got OX4s in a few of my guitars and every single time I put them in, there's just something about them just really resonates with me. They are absolutely amazing. So check out Mark's pickups. They are wonderful, wonderful things. Steve Turner, I think I listened to this video with my eyes rather than my ears. Fair enough, I think most of us do to an extent. The 330 sounded a lot more airy and I want one now. So this guitar is just absolutely phenomenal. There is another question about this guitar here actually. Paul Stafford Cook, again. I love that 330, I need one. I love the feedback, love the looks. I'd even put up with the lack of upper fretboard access. Gorgeous. There is, this is just one of the most outstanding sounding guitars I've ever played. Every time I bring it out on this channel, which is only in a kind of select set of circumstances because it is a bit of a diva in terms of you can't play it too loud, you can't use too much gain, you don't have that fretboard access up top because the cutaway's much, it, the neck's set much further into the guitar than a 335, so you can't really get to the top frets very easily. So it is a bit problematic at times, but when it's in its happy place, you cannot beat it. And whenever I bring it out on the channel and sort of hit the opening chord, half the YouTube comments section go, what? Like, it's just phenomenal, especially for recording. If I had to go to a session and only take one guitar and I knew that I could be separated from the amp so feedback wasn't gonna to be too much of an issue, this is the one I would take. It is just the most perfect 
harmonically rich recording guitar with the P90s, OX4 P90s again. It just sits in a mix. It's fat but defined. It's just an outstanding instrument. If you ever get a chance to play a 330 or an Epiphone Casino, same guitar, absolutely jump on it because they are unreal. Ag Agus GT. I have two 335s and one 330. Being a Strat guy, the 330 is so special. Single coil P90 pickups, absolutely. So if you're coming from a Strat world and you like that kind of bright clarity single coil thing, the, three, three, the 330 is going to give you more of that than a humbuckered semi uh, center blocked 335. That's much more of a kind of, if you're coming from a Les Paul background, the 335 probably where you would go first. If you're coming from a Strat background, go for a 330. As I said, you'll have the feedback issues a little bit in certain circumstances, but you just cannot beat that guitar in when, when it's working and it's all settled and it's not feeding back. You, you really can't beat it. It's astonishing. The 92 Project. You had a custom shop Les Paul for 17 years. You got it at five years old. Hey, nowadays I'm going to take that calculation. I'm fine with that. Yes, I'm 23, kind of. Yep, I'm absolutely cool with that. Bill Gaber, I wonder if we should use our predominant hand on the fretboard. Could it be that we are all playing with an X pointing the wrong direction? Did you try playing right-handed guitars when you started? This is a really interesting one. So when I first ever picked up a guitar when I was about 10 maybe, my mum had been to the local guitar shop and bought a 30 quid acoustic or something. And I picked it up and instinctively held it left-handed. And she was like, no, nope, you're holding it upside down. I couldn't do it. This hand just doesn't work on a fretboard. That way around, straight away I could do it. So when I started learning guitar, I ended up with a right-handed classical guitar. Again, couldn't do it. I was absolutely hopeless. I took it home, restrung it left-handed and started playing it this way. And instantly I could do when the saints come marching in or whatever it was. So I took it back to the, my guitar teacher and said, hey, look, I've restrung it and I can play it now. And she was like, she took it off me and started taking the strings off saying, I'm not teaching you left-handed, that's untraditional. So um, I pretty much finished with that guitar teacher straight away and I decided to start playing electric and bought a left-handed guitar and of course I've never looked back since. So I'm not left-handed as such but I use my right hand, it's definitely my dominant hand, for anything that requires any sort of precision. So fretting a guitar, I write with my right hand but I hold my fork in my right hand yeah, and wear my watch on my right wrist but if I'm going to throw a ball, I'll throw it in my right hand too. So anything that requires any sort of precision, I use my right hand for, and this one just kind of follows on. So all I would say is, like, if you pick up a guitar, whichever way feels natural to you to hold it, go with that. Like, I think back in the day, people like Eric Clapton, I think, are left-handed, but they learned right-handed just so they could play more guitars, because back then there weren't too many left-handed guitars. That's why Jimmy played one upside down. And, you know, that's still an issue nowadays, but it's nowhere near as much as it used to be. So whatever feels natural to you. It's a really interesting point, Bill. I don't have any sort of concrete answers on that. But yeah, my right hand is my dominant hand, and that's what I do anything that requires any sort of precision with that includes playing guitar. I've tried playing right-handed guitars right-handed, and this hand just doesn't work. I can't control those fingers in the way I can with this hand. So yeah, that's, that's all I can really say. But it's a really interesting point for sure. John Tierney. I got the fire red version today. This is about the Decibelix Golden Horse Overdrive. It's not overhyped nor overpriced. This pedal has a magic to the fidelity that is unlike anything. It's the most sparkly thing ever. It has this lightning fast attack and response. I love the trebly mid-range heavy sounds of the 60s. Beatles, Birds, Sid Barrett. This is that pedal. I have other clones. Some are incredible, but this one is the best. Now, I wanted to include this comment because this is a thread that comes up on the gear page every single day. Which is the best clone out there? How does the Ryra compare to the Centura? And things like that. Now, I've never played in original clone, full disclosure on that. I've played quite a few clones over the years and as soon as I plugged the Decibelix Golden Horse in, that was it. The sound was there. It is just perfect. If you've ever listened to a real clone online or had the fortune to play one yourself, try the, the Decibelix Golden Horse because it's the same. And if you listen to my demo video I shot of that last, it might have been earlier this year actually, I included a clip of it being compared to a real clone 
and they're a being between it and there is no difference it's absolutely dead on and yet yeah, you're absolutely right lightning fast attack it's super quick it has loads of headroom because it has the charge pump to up 9 volts to 18 volts internally so the headroom's all there it's got the the real diodes in there if that's something you're into but yeah like a lot of people sort of debate clones and clones online and i think along with things like the ryra and the centura and the mythical overdrive vintage spec the Decibex Golden Horse is right up there as being like an absolute top shelf clone. So it's a mini footprint. So if you're used to something like a Wampler Tumnus, for example, you just swap it in like I did. It's a phenomenal pedal. I cannot recommend it highly enough. It is an absolute work of art internally as well. Enrico Palazzo, I think. It's a really cool phaser. This is the uh, Fectrode uh, Phasomatic Deluxe that I did a full feature overview of a couple of weeks ago. I've only got an MXR Phase 100 just for some Clash Jimmy Jazz sound, but I use it so rarely. Maybe I have to dig a little deeper in how to use a phaser. Well, if you're wanting to explore what the ultimate phaser is capable of, the functionality of this pedal is extreme. There is nothing this pedal can't do that you might be wanting it to do. So if you're looking to really delve deep into, you know, the, the old, like pinnacle of what a phaser is capable of, this is your one, it's an outstanding pedal. But you say like, I've only got an MXR Phase 90. They're astonishingly good. I love this pedal, I need to use this pedal more. This is like a, a really old one, but it's got four settings on it, two different widths, two different types of feedback. You can get so many sounds out of this box. So you definitely haven't just got an MXR Phase 100. You've got a Phase 100, they're killer. So yeah, absolutely recommend, you know, going for a vintage Phase 100 as well. But yeah, a, a lot of people, you know, myself included, to be honest, when it comes to phases like real simple ones, like the phase 90, which is one knob. But if you're looking to really delve into some really crazy sounds, as I said in that video, the phase of Matic Deluxe can be whatever you want it to be. It can be a symmetrical four stage phaser with a speed control, like a phase 90 if you want it to. It can go absolutely nuts if you want it to as well. So there is so much in that box. Like I think I still haven't scratched the surface on what it's capable of, it's ridiculous. JJ Mayer, Effectro pedals have such a beautiful quality to them. This pedal sounds rich with huge dynamics. I'd love to hear it in a mix. Bet it records nice. I'm going to have to save up so I can pair this with my Blackbird. Absolutely. Like every Effectro pedal I've ever played is just outstanding. It's one, like they're, they're all some of the best pedals out there, especially with like the overdrive pedals, like the, the tube drive here there is nothing it does everything you could want but there's no features in there that are unnecessary you've just got volume tone drive bass boost and cut treble boost and cut and that's it but there's not a single sound in this pedal that you couldn't use like it's just it's so well thought through phil designed some of the absolute best pedals out there sonically they're amazing visually they're amazing you can swap the tubes out you can get really creative with it effectro are just outstanding in the field they really really are like especially here in the uk because they're a uk pedal brand you know if you don't want to go for a kingsley pedal and pay to import it from canada you know the effect road are right up there they are equal in terms of quality they're amazing amazing things plantagenet i think this is a British made pedal. When did Z become Z? This is another Effectro pedal. This is the fire bottle. And it has this very Z switch on the top, which controls the input impedance. And yes, it's a British made pedal. So as I said, this is all in good fun, but I said, I think I've been brainwashed by my Dr. Z amplifiers, but they came back and this really made me smile. Ha, did you play ZZ top tunes on it? As I originally thought they were called. Interestingly or not, Z was pronounced Zod back in Shakespeare's day. So I'm officially naming this the Very Zod Switch. I'm totally on board with that. So it's the Very Zod Switch from now on. David Mullins. I've wanted a semi-hollow body for a long time and finally decided to buy one, but there was no way I was going to pay for a Gibson ES335. Buying new especially, they are crazy money nowadays. I did a ton of research and it came down to three guitars. Your video helped me decide to buy the Viking, which is the Hagstrom Viking here, which I've modified, but Hagstrom Viking. I'm so glad I did. It's just gorgeous, smooth and effortless to play. And the creamy sound of that neck pickup really sets my mind on fire. Ouch. My poor Fender Strat gets no attention anymore. Great video and I really enjoyed your playing. By the way, I'm a lefty too. 
Hey! So, yeah, I if you are looking to kind of just set foot into the 335 type world and you're not going all out for a Gibson or a Heritage or something like that, these are really, really, really good guitars. Now, of course, I've made a few mods to it. The Bigsby isn't standard. I've put gold foil pickups in. And I am going to do a standalone demo of this guitar fairly shortly in its current form because these gold foils really work well in this guitar. But the build quality of this guitar, I can't remember exactly where it's built. I think I might have peeled the sticker off now. I think it's Korea or China or something. The build quality is really, really good. And there was another question about this guitar here. I noticed on various videos, people complaining about the fretwork of some Hagstrom guitars. Frets being very sharp, not rounded. Any comments on that from Hagstrom users? Yeah, they're great. Really, really nice fretwork. As, um, as we said before, very thin neck on this, so it's really easy to play, low frets. It, it's just a really, really solid guitar for the money. So really recommend these. Um, the stock pickups that I had in here were actually really nice. I just wanted to experiment, so I took them out. But yeah, really can't recommend these guitars highly enough, especially for the money. They're absolutely solid. They're not like a beginner entry level guitar at all. They're professional quality, very well made. You can customize them if you want to. But yeah, just really, really nice instruments. And finally, the Mog, okay? Hello, Joe, love your videos. Really appreciate you taking the time to make them for us. No worries at all. Just a reminder for you to make a Perky's 2020 analog guitar rig slash pedal board video. Aha. So it'll be a 2021 video, but it's going live at midnight tonight. So yes, don't worry, it's coming. It's the most ridiculous pedal board I've ever built. It's still all analog, it's very boutique. I think the gig rig generator power supply is about to explode powering that many pedals, but it's as far as I can take the all analog pedal board concept on the, the physical board I have using the power setup I've got and all that. Like there is no room for anything. So it's the most ridiculous board I've ever done, but I'm dead happy with the sounds that I've been getting from it. It sounds really, really good. So don't worry, I haven't forgotten. Midnight tonight, it'll be live. So I think that is it for this month. So again, you know, thank you ever so much to everyone who supported this channel for the last year. It's grown a lot this year, which is fantastic to see. And what makes it worthwhile is having these interactions with you guys, reading your comments, replying to each other and all that sort of stuff. So thank you ever so much to everyone who's engaged with the channel this year. There's a lot of interesting things happening next year. In January alone, uh, what am I gonna be doing? I've been sent some Citec pedals from Poland, a fuzz and a distortion, so I'm going to be looking at those. I'm going to be looking at some power tubes, comparing EL34s to KT77s. Um, I'm going to be comparing stock JJ tubes to the premium like Genelex Gold Lion rear shoes. I think I'm going to be looking at another Fane speaker, a Neodymium speaker, which I've never really looked at before, so I'm looking forward to doing that. So there's a lot of really fun things happening just next month. So. As I always say, thank you ever so much for watching, folks. I hope these videos this year have been interesting and useful for you. Any comments or questions or video requests, drop them underneath if I can make a video or just reply to your comment answering. I will absolutely do so. But thanks, folks. And uh, yeah, please do carry on subscribing to this channel. I know I always say that in every single video, but it does make a huge difference when you subscribe. And I will see you in 2021 in a few hours. Bye-bye.